Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's nice to see you all on this rainy day. My name is Ryan Streeter. I'm the Director of Domestic Policy Studies here at AEI, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event today um, with Dr. Jim Dwyer from William & Mary Law School. Uh, we're really looking forward to his remarks about his new book, uh, which has already provoked some interesting discussion uh, out there and online. And uh, we'd also, speaking of online, want to welcome those who are tuning in from their desks or their homes as well and, and remind everyone that this will be available uh, after this event uh, for you to watch uh, again and to, and to send around to your friends and colleagues. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Dwyer is going to offer some remarks here to, to get us going about the book and related themes and then he'll be joined by AEI fellow Naomi Riley for a, a discussion here up front and then that will be followed by a question and answer time. Um, Jim Dwyer is the Arthur B. Hansen Professor of Law at William & Mary Law School where he teaches family law, youth law, trust and estates, uh, philosophy of law, and constitutional law. He has served as a law guardian, guardian in the New York State Family Court and was part of the Virginia Governor's Task Force on Expediting Adoptions. Um, I, if, you, if you're not familiar with his work, I would encourage you to go to his uh, scholar page at the university. Uh, you'll see his many books listed there and his articles, um, all of which I th think are of great interest. Uh, he earned his PhD in philosophy from Stanford University and has a law degree from Yale Law School. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Dwyer to AEI. Thanks very much for introduction, having me here and attending. Uh, terrific that you would turn out for this important topic. Uh, if the PowerPoint gets started, I will first call your attention to the book cover. Uh, do I have the clicker? Uh, which has a picture of a river on it with a big rock in the middle. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and I chose this picture for the book cover because it uh, is evocative of one of the metaphors in the book, which uh, is that of the uh, River Babies parable. Some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, short story is uh, a bunch of villagers are ne working next to a river. One of them sees a baby floating down, already suffering from water uh, ingestion and uh, from battering against rocks, headed for certain destruction. Uh, and this villager jumps into the river to try to save the baby, quickly sees there's another one, another one, soon there are dozens and then hundreds of babies coming down the river. Uh, calls all the other villagers, they're all trying to save them by, by various means, let's divert some of the water, let's shout out swimming instructions to the babies and so forth. Uh, and then one of them starts walking away and the rest say, what are you doing, we need all the help we can get. Uh, and this person says, well I'm going upstream to stop whoever's throwing the babies in the water. So uh, the point is uh, to you know, distinguish between remediation of uh, children after they are already damaged, uh, which is the prevailing approach today, and true prevention, which is avoiding children being damaged in the first place, uh, being thrown into the river, uh, getting uh, placed into the cradle that is part of the cradle to prison pipeline, part of the intergenerational cycle of uh, damage and dysfunction that so many uh, children in our society experience, and in particular children in communities of poverty uh, who are disproportionately of minority race. Uh, so the remediation approach is wait until the children are damaged and then provide therapy, other services, you know, preschool. Somehow we are going to fix uh, these children after they've been damaged by uh, just spending more on these types of programs. But in fact, they do very little to remediate the damage that's been done. Uh, and so the thrust of the book is we need some serious, hard-nosed prevention efforts to stop the intergenerational cycle um, and... Uh, spare children from uh, becoming damaged adults who themselves uh, are become parents who uh, cause their children in turn to have adverse early childhood experiences. Uh, so uh, part of the problem with the prevailing liberal approach in the child welfare field, uh, and just say up front, I'm a Rawlsian liberal, Bernie Sanders voter, um, and so this is kind of an insider critique of liberal child welfare policy. Um, so part of the problem is that liberals are focused on remediation and very reluctant to uh, uh, adopt true preventive measures. Uh, but when they do think about prevention, uh, their proposals tend to be, uh, to fall into one of these categories, 
Uh, first of all, sort of make life fair legislation. Let's spend enormous amounts of money on eliminating poverty. Uh, let's re-educate people so there's no more racism, right? Uh, so sort of unrealistic uh, wealth transfer proposals. Uh, and then in addition, let's fix everybody who's already damaged. Let's rehabilitate uh, struggling parents, unfit parents, uh, find programs that will overcome addiction, mental illness, mental disability, and so forth, so that they can adequately care for children. Uh, let's fix dysfunctional communities, uh, toxic communities, where we, which we know have an independent negative effect on children. Um, if we just get conservatives to you know, agree to pony up the money, then we can fix everybody in every place, uh, and so children will not have to experience uh, adversity. Um, but the reality is that we do not know how to uh, fix damaged people or communities. Um, and uh, in addition, there is simply no more money uh, for uh, the kinds of programs that liberals uh, would like to see put in place that they say would uh, avoid the problem, would uh, transform people and communities if only we were willing to do that. Uh, and interestingly, research suggests that even most liberals uh, who are affluent are not willing to pay more taxes for these kinds of programs. Uh, so there is no more money. Money would not help much. Uh, money helps at the margins, uh, but we do not know how to fix deeply damaged people. Uh, and the problem with trying to uh, do these things when you have some resources, trying to uh, uh, transform people who are already damaged is A, that you divert resources right, that could be uh, spent elsewhere. You divert attention, uh, you deflect attention, right, from things that might actually work. Uh, liberals are, are repeatedly coming up with new kinds of programs, child welfare interventions that they think will be successful. It's the next, you know, magic pill. Um, and so let's try that instead of doing something that, is, uh, that appears more harsh, that's going to inflict uh, any more suffering on people who have already suffered disadvantage. Um, and uh, the programs and policies they tend to favor have the result of uh, uh, putting more children at greater risk of maltreatment by forcing them to remain in unsafe homes for longer periods of time and delaying permanence. So uh, the upshot of the fact that there is no more money and we don't know how to fix already damaged people uh, with much success is that in uh, many families, in many communities, there is a conflict of interest between adults and children. And much of liberal reaction to the situation uh, can be explained by an unwillingness to acknowledge such conflict uh, because then they might face a choice. Right? If there's a conflict of interest, are you going to sacrifice those of adults, uh, adults who have already suffered a great deal, um, in order to protect children? Um, the predominant liberal instinct is to protect the adults, right, who they see have already suffered from social injustice, uh, and I fully agree with that, um, and to make every last effort to save these people and preserve their uh, relationships with their children, uh, keep children in communities so that the communities are not weakened by uh, removal of uh, children and families, <clears throat> Uh, and then after the fact, to try to rationalize away whatever effect there is on children, uh, sort of ignore whatever research, whatever social science uh, has been done, which suggests that their approach is not working. Um, and so life goes on with this repeated attempt to find the program that is finally going to <clears throat> uh, fix everyone and harm no one. From a child-centered perspective, which is where I come from, um, I think that we need to uh, stop, uh, eliminate this fantasy uh, that we can rehabilitate uh, every unfit parent. Uh, we need to change the social worker uh, ethos and ethic um, of extreme family preservationism uh, and instead make hard-nosed, rational, child-centered decision-making about parentage uh, at the time of birth uh, and about how to respond to maltreatment after it's reported. Uh, and one important part of that is being sensitive to developmental stage 
uh, for children, which is something that is generally not true of child welfare policy. We tend to have one rule for all children, regardless of age, one approach to intervention, uh, which is generally to give parents as much time as uh, we possibly can to turn themselves around and recover uh, possession of their children. Uh, when in fact we should have a very different approach with newborns and infants than we do with older children. So I want you to think about uh, the worst neighborhoods in America, uh, riven with poverty, violence, addiction, uh, hopelessness. There are a lot of children being born in these neighborhoods, right? Uh, a bad life outcome is predictable for a great percentage of them. Right, uh, judges who work in these communities see it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, if you imagine going to the maternity ward of the hospital in that community, walking down uh, the hallway and seeing how many uh, black males, uh, babies, are in these rooms, if you were to uh, do this, you could predict, you could dependably predict that every other male child in that ward is a future prison inmate. When you think about it in that terms, it's really uh, striking and discouraging, uh, but true. And then ask yourself, how can we possibly prevent that? Uh, and I think the reality is that if all of them are going home uh, with their parents to these communities, um, <clears throat> that we are not going to change that future for them. Uh, and we need to be thinking uh, uh, very seriously about what a child-centered approach to parentage and child custody uh, and long-term caregiving would be uh, and location about where children live. So uh, the proposals that I offer in the book, which I guess has been called one of the most uh, radical books on child welfare policy ever, um, follows children from the prenatal period uh, into uh, the child protection system. Later in life, I'm uh, more confident, uh, sort of normatively, about uh, those involving children after birth. Uh, but I do have some uh, points in the book about prenatal life. Uh, one is to support programs like Project Prevention that uh, give uh, people who are not prepared to parent an incentive not to conceive children, uh, for example, by accepting long-term contraceptives. Uh, once uh, a child is conceived, doing what we can to prevent prenatal harm from substance abuse in particular. Uh, and for that, I propose not criminalizing uh, use of drugs uh, during pregnancy, which I think is not effective, uh, but instead targeting suppliers uh, from whom these women are receiving drugs, uh, providing uh, ultra-safe prenatal care facilities where there's no risk of reporting uh, to authorities, uh, and as a last-ditch uh, measure, civil commitment uh, when necessary to prevent children, but that would need to be narrowly tailored to uh, the kinds of substances that are uh, demonstrably very harmful to children. As I said, I'm more confident about uh, the measures that I propose for afterbirth, uh, and the first of those is uh, more intelligent uh, parentage decision-making, identifying parents at the time of birth uh, who pose a high risk of maltreatment. So there are a couple of things that are now being done uh, in this vein uh, that I would simply expand. So uh, toxicology testing of newborns is, fair, is quite common, um, but it's not legally mandated uh, universally anywhere, right? So there are a few states that say uh, medical facilities that have reason to believe mother is uh, uh, using, uh, abusing substances should test or may test. Um, but I suggest that we have universal toxicology testing of newborns. Uh, secondly, there are now four states that are doing something called birth match, which is essentially a background check, to, uh, a check on birth parents to see if they have a maltreatment history. Right? It's the sort of uh, background information you would want if you were dating someone. Right? Have they ever abused someone else in a relationship? Uh, is there anything else in their background, substance abuse, criminal history, whatever? to suggest they might be a danger to me, right? And if you would do that as a competent adult with some ability for self-protection, then you can imagine that uh, someone acting as a proxy decision maker for a newborn baby uh, ought to be doing the same. Uh, so I uh, 
propose a robust birth match program where you uh, search existing databases for past child maltreatment, for criminal history, um, for children, uh, parents who've had rights terminated before or have children in the system now, so that we have a better sense at the time of a child's birth whether birth parents pose a high risk of maltreatment. Uh, secondly, more aggressive permanency action decision making for newborns. Uh, when you are, <clears throat> when you bring a 10 or 12 year old into the system, right, a long period of rehabilitation for the parents makes sense, right? Those parents are who the child knows, has some attachment relationship with probably, uh, and that child is not very adoptable. Uh, but with newborns, uh, you're talking about children who are highly adoptable, uh, who do not have a relationship with the parents, um, and uh, who can be spared from the damage of maltreatment. Uh, so much shorter permanency timelines for newborns uh, than for older children. Uh, this was initially in a draft of the Adoption Safe Families Act back in the 90s, uh, but my understanding that it was principally liberal uh, legislators who resisted that, and so uh, instead, we have a one-size-fits-all rule for a uh, <clears throat> timeline following a maltreatment report. Uh, in addition, I would expand the grounds for termination of parental rights. Um, there are examples in states now of uh, termination based on incarceration, uh, based on existing uh, addiction, substance abuse, uh, and so I'd just like to see those in, in more states. And the last idea uh, was kind of an intellectual frolic for me initially, but then I started to take it seriously. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to make this more palatable in a moment. But the basic idea is we currently don't allow parents, right, to locate their children next to factories, uh, on the streets, right? There are some places we tell parents you may, simply may not have your children live. Uh, and so the suggestion is let's identify the most toxic neighborhoods uh, in this country and add those to the list of places where you simply may not uh, live with a child. When you have a child, you need to move out of there. Uh, ideally, uh, with government assistance, I would you know, certainly support a lot of spending for relocation. Um, but for the same reasons, uh, we s simply shouldn't allow children to be Growing up in places where the crackle of gunfire is a daily event, where they observe people being shot in the streets, where they're afraid to walk to school, uh, where gang involvement uh, seems inevitable. So trying to make any of this more palatable, <clears throat> I will uh, present some critical normative assumptions, some of which I think are generally overlooked, uh, require uh, kind of overall reversal of the way people tend to think about uh, these, uh, the legal systems, treatment of children in this situation. So the standard of reaction is say, well, this is a massive expansion of government power uh, over people's personal lives, right? Uh, but in fact, uh, the reality is that in the current uh, situation, the government is heavily and fatally involved in these children's lives because it is, after all, the government, the state, our agent that makes laws, right? And it's because of our parentage laws that particular people do become the legal parents of children with presumptive rights of custody. And it's because the state decides how much power these people have over the lives of children that they end up living in certain places that parents have this power to decide, yes, my child will live in a place where it's unsafe uh, even to go out in the hallway uh, because there might be substance abusers there. So what I'm proposing is not an expansion of government power, but a change in the way that the government exercises its uh, unavoidable decision-making authority over who raises children, right? There really is no uh, neutral stance. There is no possibility of the state just walking away from uh, family life. Uh, the, the state must decide, must create families, legal families. And that determines children's lives to a great extent. And I would say that the current regime where you confer legal status on biological parents regardless of their background is a horrible abuse of state power. Right? So you can imagine if the state started arranging marriages, sort of forcing you to be in legal relationships 
uh, and giving another person power over your life uh, with total disregard uh, for what you wanted and, and in addition to what dangers this person poses, you would see, well, that's a horrible abuse of state power, right? And just as when the state gave husbands power over wives, we could see that's state action for which the state should be responsible. It's the same with parental power, right? The state is giving that through its laws to these people, power over another person's life, and the, the state should be accountable for that. Uh, and secondly, children, obviously, uh, like incompetent adults, have moral and constitutional rights against uh, the states that constrain how the state uh, exercises its power. And so I would say the current parentage regime uh, is uh, a matter of a reckless disregard for child welfare um, and uh, is unconstitutional. Uh, so, you know, if you think about the analogy to a guardian ward relationship uh, for incompetent adults, uh, we would not tolerate the sorts of things in, in connection with those uh, relationships that we do with parent-child relationships, like appointing someone as a guardian who has a history of horrible maltreatment uh, with incompetent adult wards. <clears throat> uh, when you find out that a caregiver is maltreating a ward, giving them a lengthy rehabilitation period uh, for their sake, right, for their benefit because you feel sorry for them, uh, instead of uh, making a decision to protect the dependent, vulnerable person. Uh, and in addition, uh, leaving caregivers unconstrained in the kind of environment that they create for the ward, right? So it seems to me that children should have the same right as an incompetent adult against state decision-making that puts them into these dangerous positions. Uh, and if you're wondering about constitutional rights of parents, uh, the book goes through the doctrine, other things that I've written uh, does that as well, and the reality is that unfit, people who are unfit to be parents do not have any constitutional rights at all. Uh, we have a procedural right uh, against the state that it demonstrate our fitness, if we are already legal parents, uh, it demonstrate our unfitness, uh, but once determined to be unfit, uh, constitutional doctrine does not confer any rights against severance of the parent-child relationship. So the kinds of reactions you get from liberals, uh, and the term liberati was coined by uh, someone named David Stowes, who's in the social work field, uh, has trained social workers, uh, and reflects his observation of a kind of ideology that dominates the field these days, kind of postmodernist uh, skepticism about science and a tendency to view everything the state does to poor people. Uh, as part of an evil narrative that starts with slavery or genocide or uh, something else. And so you just slot uh, the, the latest proposal that would inflict more suffering on these people into that kind of narrative. Um, so the reactions that uh, you tend to get reflecting an adult-centered instinct and outlook uh, is to say, well, there's a negative disparate impact on people of minority race. Uh, from a child-centered perspective, I would say a disparate positive impact right? These are uh, policies you're adopting to benefit uh, people of minority race, children, uh, even if uh, you understand and regret that there might be uh, more suffering on adults as a result. Uh, they'll mischaracterize what you're doing, uh, you know, exaggerating, this is criminalizing pregnancy, even though you're doing nothing like that, stealing babies as if they are pre-owned by birth parents, uh, blaming the victims when, in fact, for me, blame is entirely irrelevant. Um, and again, putting in this kind of narrative when, in fact, what you're trying to do is end the subordination, uh, the racism, uh, the stereotyping, and the deaths that have afflicted uh, these communities. Uh, so last slide uh, just makes an interesting point about ideology and how it plays into uh, child welfare thinking in different realms. So I've also written a lot about religious uh, parental opposition to child welfare norms in the context of education and medical care. Uh, and there, there's a, a reversal. So uh, there you find liberals tend to be more child-centered, very protective, not sympathetic to the uh, parents. Uh, and I think that's because they view the parents as responsible. You're making a choice that harms your children, and so we blame you for that, and we're not going to allow it. Um, but in the poverty context, we don't blame you because you are victims of long-term social injustice, and therefore we sympathize with you. 
Conservatives, on the other hand, um, tend to uh, protect and support uh, people, adults, who match a certain ideal of the citizen, right? Someone who is self-sufficient, who acts on principle. Uh, and so in the religious context, they are very defensive uh, toward parents um, and sort of overlook the effect or downplay the effect on children. Uh, but in this context, I think they would be much more receptive than liberals to the kinds of things that I'm proposing because they tend to be less sympathetic to people they think are harming others because of incapacity um, or uh, lack of uh, principle, um, uh, who are simply dysfunctional, who don't match the ideal. Uh, so I think that's an interesting point about ideology and whether any of this is politically uh, sellable to anyone. And, uh, from your skeptical faces, I will guess it's a hard sell. Um, this is, by the way, one of my favorite charts. I don't know if the chart appears in the book, but this analysis I found fascinating. Um, I had just finished reading um, this book that's on the bestseller list by Tara Westover um, called Educated, and she a, a, grew up in a fundamentalist Mormon home and had all these kinds of deprivation. I mean, her father was crazy, and you know, they, they didn't eat you know, real food for a while, and they were being raised in the wilderness, and he was having her operate you know, heavy farm machinery when she was like 10 years old, and people were losing limbs. And it occurred to me you know, that a lot of people would want to, reasonably enough, take this woman away from her home. Um, amazingly, I think of her, there were seven siblings, I think four of them ended up with PhDs. Um, they all ended up being educated, or most of them ended up being educated. Anyway, they all managed to survive childhood uh, without uh, too many difficulties. And then I thought about, you know, the equivalent of the, of the child who's growing up uh, in one of these neighborhoods that, um, that you describe in your book. And, and the likelihood that they would have similar outcomes. And uh, that, that chart, I think, says it all in terms of the reactions that conservatives and liberals have to intervening in the family, that we have very different standards about this. But um, anyway, I, I wanted to uh, just start by kind of drilling down into some of the, um, the things you were talking about. The, the first thing uh, that you talked about is um, damaged children. And I want to just drill down into that, uh, into that term that you use um, and, and find out you know, how you define you know, a deeply damaged child, because I think that's very important to have this discussion, understand what the terms are of this debate. Right. So uh, what we find with uh, children who go home with uh, parents who are not functioning well because of substance abuse or mental illness, um, one is that they will simply not form a secure attachment. Uh, during the first couple of years of life, and that in itself has uh, certain consequences that affects your entire way of interacting with the world, right? If you have an insecure attachment, the world is not a nurturing place for you, and you react to it as such. Uh, and so much of uh, later manifestations of mental health problems, delinquency and uh, criminal activity with uh, early pregnancy, gang involvement, uh, is a reflection of this failure to form a secure attachment. Um, but then abuse, of course, can traumatize, can uh, leave psychological scars um, that make it very difficult for a child to have healthy relationships with other people, um, to uh, have any self-esteem, um, simply to develop normally uh, in terms of their brain uh, so that they can function well in school, um, and otherwise cope with life. So, and of course, you can have severe physical uh, harms that result from shaking a baby or um, breaking limbs and, and so forth. Um, you mentioned, obviously, in, in uh, several of your points, the effect of substance abuse on this population of kids. And um, I know you've, uh, you know you've done a lot of work in the uh, child welfare system yourself. You've talked to social workers. You've been uh, involved in the family court system. Can you describe uh, just the effects of substance abuse on these kids and, and 
uh, how much of the deeply damaged child population is really the result of substance abuse? All right, well, some of it is, is prenatal harm, and it varies considerably based on the kind of substance that's, that's used. Uh, and in fact, some things that are illicit substance, substances, like uh, tobacco, can, can be quite harmful. Some of the effects are short term, some are long, long term. It could depend on what kind of uh, nurturing they receive after birth. Um, but there can be permanent neurological damage from uh, prenatal exposure to certain substances. Um, and then after uh, birth, there, is, uh, the, the pro there are the problems that uh, parents might be unavailable to provide nurturing because they are seeking or using uh, drugs. Uh, parents can act erratically when, when they are uh, abusing certain substances. Uh, you see parents rolling on top of babies. You see um, parents uh, acting violently um, uh, or just leaving the home uh, with children unattended. Um, and uh, I think a secure attachment is very unlikely with a parent that's chronically uh, abusing substances. They're just not giving the attention to the child that the child needs or the right kind of attention. I wanted to, uh, to sort of just talk about, um, you call them the Liberati, but let's sort of, uh, Let's tease it out a little bit. I wanted to, um, to talk a little bit about, just to begin with, the attitude of people who are doing the social work on the ground, people who are involved in child protective services or social workers who are trying to work with these families. You describe in the book something called the 1% rule. And I wonder if you could just, just explain a little bit about that and, and what the mentality is of the social workers who are um, trying to help these families. Right, the mentality is totally understandable. People go into this field because they want to help people. Um, and what they are taught in school of social work is how to help people, uh, ideally to fix people who are damaged. Uh, and so that's what they are professionally inclined to do infinitely, right? So they're not trained in triage decision making about parentage. They're not trained on when to throw in a towel, right, for particular parents. It's just fix people, fix people, fix people. Um, uh, so that's the professional orientation. And then think about you know, their role in the community uh, where they are dealing with adults and they're dealing with parents primarily, um, trying to get them hooked up with services and otherwise uh, help them. The kind of identif identification develops with the parents. And it's very difficult to say, we are stopping, right? We are not going to return your child. Um, and so they wait until the law forces them to say, well, you know, the timeline has run. There's nothing I can do. I have to bring this to court, and we have to go forward. Um, so uh, as I said, much of it is understandable, and um, I think social workers should not be making some of the decisions that they are making. I don't know that they should be doing investigations, um, uh, but uh, let me, some let me other ask kind you of about professional... That, so do you think that we should be um, doing more to sort of separate the role of the social worker as the investigator and the social worker as the helper? Should these be, you know, two different jobs? Um, you know, is there always inevitably going to be that conflict of interest? And, you know, isn't it just hard, you know, to, to have as your profession, you know, helping families and then also in the back of your mind knowing when to throw in the towel? Right, and this is particularly difficult when uh, agencies engage in concurrent planning, um, as federal legislation now encourages them to do, which is where you make a pre-adoptive placement of a child uh, with potential adopters and at the same time trying to rehabilitate the parents. If the same social worker is doing both of these, the conflict is huge. But sure, just um, you know, initially conducting an investigation, knowing that if the child comes into the system, then you have to deal with these parents and in a kind of counseling uh, way uh, can create that uh, concern about a conflict. Um, and in part just because of, of training, I think uh, if there were going to be more resources for anything, it might be let's have more social workers so you can say, all right, this is the investigation unit. Uh, you need people who understand sort of what causes maltreatment and uh, what, it, what uh, is a likely an indicator of likely rehabilitation. Um, and the people who are providing uh, the counseling. Um, you, you mentioned uh, in your talk the Adoption and Safe Families Act. Uh, so that was passed in 1997. Um, and it mandated that children who have been in the foster system for 
15 out of the last 22 months uh, be made available for adoption. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about what you think of that law. You mentioned that it didn't make any distinctions uh, based on the age of children, but um, are there other critiques that you have of that law? Do you think that it is being enforced properly? Um, and, and are there things that you would change about it if we were going to revisit it today? Right, so it was a step in the right direction. The idea was, was right. Uh, as I said, initially there were, was a shorter timeline proposed for uh, uh, very young children, uh, and that was eliminated. Uh, uh, at least a couple of states do have shorter timelines for infants, and I think uh, that is a good thing. It's a necessary thing. Um, the, that particular provision has uh, you know, exceptions that you know, they say you can drive a truck through. Um, if the child is in kin care, right, placed with relatives, then the timeline doesn't apply. If the social worker can convince a judge that it's not in the best interest to uh, go forward with the termination petition, uh, then uh, they're excused from doing so. Um, so right idea, but it's incomplete. Uh, and it's interesting what reaction liberals uh, largely have had to the 1522 rule, which is to say, well, so much of child maltreatment is a result of substance abuse. You can't stop addiction so quickly. It takes years, uh, you know, if it's going to be stopped at all. So these parents need more time. So a very adult focused, you're not, this is unfair to the parents, you need to give them more time. From a child center perspective, you'd say, well, that sounds like a reason not to wait 15 months with uh, people with certain addictions. Said you need to make a decision much sooner. Um, part of the title of your book, uh, and one of the reasons why uh, I think it, it it, it is so provocative, is you're specifically focused on the way the child welfare system treats black children. Um, we had a lot of discussions in this country now. Uh, the subject of disparate impact uh, impacts pretty much every aspect of our, of our policy life. Um, and I was wondering if you can just specifically talk about why you think black children in particular uh, are the, why they're the focus of this particular book mm -hmm. and, um, and how you think they have been um, particularly mistreated by the system. Okay, well, uh, of course, uh, maltreatment is uh, something that affects children of, of all races. Poverty uh, affects uh, people of all races. <clears throat> I think a lot of the resistance uh, to more aggressive child protection measures comes from those who <clears throat> think in each instance in terms of what's the impact going to be on a particular community, and they mostly have poor black communities in mind. Um, in particular with this <clears throat> uh, liberati, this sort of <clears throat> postmodernist uh, ideology that social work schools uh, impose on social workers, uh, that's what comes first into people's minds when you talk about shorter timelines and uh, interventions to stop uh, pregnant women from using Drugs, it's, well, this is, you know, targeting uh, people of minority race. Um, so I'm just taking that head on and saying, well, let's talk about what uh, is really a, a pro, uh, you know, policy for people of minority race. Is it the existing regime where we keep allowing uh, children to be damaged? Uh, or uh, is it one that protects them more aggressively? So again, from my perspective, uh, there's a positive dis disparate impact on, on black people uh, as a result of what I'm proposing. Um, and it is the reality that uh, poverty disproportionately impacts black children um, and maltreatment correlates with poverty. So. And not just uh, poverty, but also uh, family structure uh, impacts uh, abuse rates and things like that. Um, are there, are there other reasons why you think uh, black children are particularly negatively impacted by the current system? Yeah, unlike with uh, white poverty, uh, black poverty tends to be concentrated. Uh, so you find it more in uh, urban areas where uh, children uh, <clears throat> experience dysfunction not just in the home and maybe not even so much in the home, but they are surrounded in their neighborhood. Um, by dysfunction, by substance abuse, by criminal involvement, by violence, uh, by unemployment, um, uh, by <clears throat> uh, housing instability, uh, and so forth. 
Uh, and there's a well-documented documented neighborhood effect on children. So it's not just who your parents are, what is your home environment like, um, but what is your community like? Is it a place where you are terrified to go out outdoors? Is it a place where you can't carry books to school because you're afraid you're going to be chased down uh, and violence perpetrated on you? Uh, is it a, a place where no one uh, seems to have any hope, where prospects for your future seem dim because no one is getting out of there uh, alive? Um, so <clears throat> uh, that is something that uh, I think affects uh, black children more than uh, white children who are in poverty. Um, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned that uh, this was a book that you kept uh, stopping and starting again, that it was hard for you to come to the conclusions that you did in this book. And, and in fact, I had this sense that you know, uh, you know, your plan A would be you know, flooding these areas with lots of money and lots of programs, you know, if you could find the ones that would work, and you know, maybe Bernie Sanders would be able to do that for you. <laughs> Um, and that you came to this plan B uh, kind of reluctantly. Uh, is, was that the case? And can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the process of, of how you arrived at these conclusions? Yeah, well, it's a very striking thing to say about your, your colleagues, the other people in the field. Uh, and it's most of the people in the legal academy and other ac academic departments. Um, so, yeah, I kept stopping and thinking, uh, you know, I must be wrong because uh, uh, disagreeing with so many people. Um, and I'm a liberal and I'm criticizing uh, fellow liberals, um, is there some other way? And uh, although, yes, I support much greater spending on social programs, ultimately I've concluded that would not do it. I mean, it, money is not the problem. The problem is you already have damaged people in whose custody you are putting children, uh, and money is not going to fix them. Uh, and you, I, mean, I can imagine some kind of program where you just have you know, helpers in every home with problematic parents. So if there is substance abuse, there's always someone there to, to pick up childcare, and that might work. But then you're talking about, you know, complaints about incursions on civil liberties. You're really going to have people posted in their houses. Um, and in addition, the money's not there. It, actually, your, uh, your approach reminded me a lot of uh, some of the school reform uh, people who, I think if they had their druthers would be able to make the public school system work better. Uh, but in the absence of that, you know, they have uh, supported vouchers or charter schools or other things simply because they found that the public school system, you know, seems unchangeable to them. And in the meantime, you know, you have kids who are suffering. So what are you going to do about those, you know, those kids now? I mean, you could talk about um, the long-term structural uh, issues and maybe, you know, 50 or 100 years from now you could make those changes. but. Um, you know, but what are you going to do about the, the kids who are suffering in, in this instance? Right. A related point is that people, many people put an awful lot of faith in the schools to fix children who are coming from, who are already damaged and or coming from uh, these environments where they're distracted in school uh, and, and suffering from what's going on in home, at home and what's going on in the community. And you think, well, if you just give them better teachers by paying higher salaries, you know, try to convince people to go into this neighborhood uh, to teach. Uh, then the, the kids will be much better off, and that's just false. I mean, the, the social science does not uh, back up that faith uh, that schools can fix what these communities and, and families are doing to children. Um, there's a lot of talk now about the over-involvement of child protective services in the lives of families, and it's coming from different places now. Uh, so you have kind of a, a free-range parents who are um, irritated reasonably so, that you know, police are coming to investigate them if they leave their kids in the car when they go into the dry cleaner. Um, and I, these, these kind of, uh, th these discussions are sort of tr starting to um, kind of meld into one another. And I wonder if you can kind of talk about, I, I read a statistic that um, something like a third of American children will come into contact with CPS um, before their 18th birthday, which seems like a, a wildly large amount of children. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of talk about how we can, um, you know, isolate and really uh, kind of hone on, hone in on the, the the kids that you know who are who most need these services and who are in the greatest danger. Well, I think that already happens. So you have these anecdotes about some crazy removal of children because they were walking home alone from school in a perfectly safe neighborhood, right? And you think CPS is 
just overboard. These people have huge caseloads. They often do not have spaces for the children that they take into uh, custody. Um, they are not out there roving around looking for more kids to sweep up, right? They are trying to avoid removals, uh, but they're getting reports, right, on a, a constant basis. Um, many states have adopted this uh, approach called differential response, which channels an awful lot of reports to a so-called assessment track, where you don't even do an investigation, where you do nothing coercive. You just walk up and tap on the door and say, would you like some money and maybe some services? Right, and social workers, I think, love that, right? I don't have to do an investigation. Uh, I'm not gonna take the child into custody unless I see something else when I get there. Um, I'm just offering help, uh, and so parents aren't so angry at me. Uh, sounds wonderful, and I, I mean, I, it just doesn't ring true to me that uh, there is an awful lot of inappropriate uh, removals of children or, or CPS uh, action uh, against parents. Um, can you sort of talk a little bit about uh, the, the the process? I mean, um, there's a lot of there's a sort of a lot of people claim that the the biggest problem affecting you know CPS is that there is not enough money and there are not enough social workers. Um, it sounds like you sort of agree with that that it would be helpful to have more people on the ground. But what you're saying is that this that the at bottom this is more of a of a policy direction question and that. Um, more money and more staff is not going to fix what ails a lot of these communities. And so with money, you could have uh, you know, more caseworkers and maybe different units for uh, different tasks. You could recruit more adoptive parents and more foster parents and uh, make it more attractive for people to do those things. Um, but ultimately, I think it is a policy problem and an ideology problem. Uh, that the system is much more about um, family preservation at all costs, about pre uh, sparing parents from losing uh, custody of their children or having their relationships with their children severed. Um, I think uh, you know, one extreme example of this ideology uh, that I've mentioned to you is prison nurseries, where even when uh, women are incarcerated and give birth, we are going to put the children into the prison uh, with them instead of thinking about adoption in those cases. So there's definitely a mentality of extreme family preservationism that's dominating the field um, without research to suggest that this is actually producing good child welfare outcomes. Um, some of the, the critics would, you know, would reasonably look at your policy suggestions and say, you know, is it, is it really the case that um, if you remove these children that they're going to be put into homes that are preferable to the ones they're coming from. Uh, a lot of people point to abuses in the foster care system. Um, and you know, they would ask, you know, how many of these children are really going to uh, be adoptable um, in the long term? Um, can you address sort of the what is this better than question? Right, and that's why the earliest intervention is crucial. So the demand, if you want to call it that, for adoption of infants under age one, and particularly for newborns, is immense in this country. Right, so no problem placing uh, a newborn or a five-month-old uh, in a pre-adoptive home or an adoptive home. Uh, and many people are willing to be foster parents first uh, uh, with the hope that they will one day adopt. Uh, but late, older children, yes, quite difficult um, to place them for adoption. And so, you know, when people think, oh, you know, kids are just going to linger in foster care forever if you take them away from your from their parents, uh, there's some, something to that when you're talking about a 12-year-old or, or a 10-year-old. Uh, but it's just not true uh, with, with an infant, you know, unless your policy is that we're going to keep the child in limbo, in this limbo, for uh, years while we keep trying with the parents uh, to make them uh, adequate caregivers. Do you think the limbo is discouraging people from adopting? The, the oh, prospect of kind of the and legal hurdles yeah. and fostering? Oh yeah, I mean, the, if I'm connected with adoption circles and this is what they all talk about, the horror of uh, the parent protective um, approach uh, uh, that the legal system encourages and the likelihoods that uh, this child that you fall in love with is going to be uh, damaged by repeated return attempts um, and then going back into foster care. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's certainly a deterrent. This is why people have gone abroad, why international adoption um, exploded in popularity uh, 20 years ago, and uh, because you could uh, you know, not have to deal with that. Children were uh, finalized for adoption. But it's difficult to uh, be a foster parent first and know that uh, you might, and, you, and, you're, and this child might suffer that fate of, of being bounced back and forth. Do you think this, um, the demand for adoption, especially of infants, is true uh, across racial lines? And do you think that um, that is, uh, that opposition to transracial adoption is, is one of the things driving our current policy? Uh, the demand is absolutely across uh, races. In fact, uh, there is a large demand among um, people of minority race who want to adopt. Um, but yes, no difficulty if there is no uh, systemic resistance to placement uh, with any infant, right? Even special needs. Um, there are uh, plenty of adoptive, uh, pl adoptive placements. Uh, but in terms of uh, transracial adoption, there is absolutely still resistance uh, despite the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act. Um, people have documented that agencies just do not want to do it. Uh, that is transracial adoption and will uh, to some extent keep children um, sort of in a non-permanent situation while they wait hoping that uh, applicants of the same race will come forward. Uh, just one last question, then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, uh, we started with this kind of weird political landscape uh, of kind of where people fall in the child <clears throat> welfare uh, issues. And I was wondering if, you know, kind of given, uh, given that, whether that gives you hope for the potential of building alliances to reform the system in the way you suggest, or whether it makes it sort of uh, impossible because people are, are not going to work across these lines and, they're, and the people who want to fix it are, are isolated politically? Well, I've never been accused of being politically realistic. <clears throat> but uh, I guess I had two hopes for the book. One is that by pointing out a pattern to liberals, of, you know, in each of these policy contexts, you are always adopting the position that protects the adults, right? protects the parents against f further suffering. Uh, and then after the fact, trying to rationalize away whatever effect that's going to have on the children. Uh, if, if I could show that you know, this is a pattern, maybe uh, they would, there would be some recognition, some acknowledgment, some movement in thinking. Um, uh, and then secondly, yeah, I expected some attention from conservatives, um, uh, you know, just seeing that some insider was critiquing a liberal policy would be enough to maybe make some people read the book and then they might find the policy prescriptions um, plausible. Uh, attractive and not be so um, resistant to them as, as liberals are. Does that lead to an alliance? I don't know. But <laughs> well, we'll yeah, see. I'm more of a, th a theorist than a <laughs> Well, we appreciate politician. that. You've got to start with the theory. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so I'm going to open up to the audience for questions. If you just raise your hand and wait for the microphone, that'd be great. And if you could identify yourself and make sure you're asking a question. Right here in front. Mark Brodsky, I know you argue that there's room for adoption. There's plenty of people want to adopt. That's probably true. But do you, f you feel that there's room for adoption of toxic children? I mean, you say you want to test for toxicity, and here you have a damaged child, and you're, you're really sure people yes. will want to adopt that child? Yes. <laughs> All right, we'll go to Catherine. So I think a fun experiment would be for you to spend a couple of weeks here with us, and then you can add a slide to your presentation, which will be entitled Conservative Opposition. And you could flesh that out here <laughs> after a couple of, of weeks. In particular, I'm wondering what your, th and I think you're probably in an environment where you're having a lot more interaction with with liberals, as you've sort of described. Um, so I don't know how much this is a kind of conversation you've been having, but 
how do you respond to the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Catherine Stevens from AAI. So, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, that to some extent, you're just replacing an intru one type of intrusive government with another type of intrusive government with a reasonable chance of unintended consequences. And in particular, you are now going to have a state that is defining hellish neighborhood, likely abusers, parental fitness, and literally taking people's children away from them based on what is going to boil down mm -hmm. to bureaucrats sitting in offices defining those things. So among the, the, the number of things I think you'll, you'd be able to put on a slide, which actually I think would be fun, you know, worthwhile to develop, conservative opposition, because um, I actually think the conservative opposition from different quarters, uh, whether libertarians or all different kinds of conservative thought, I think that slide will be as interesting and as interesting to discuss as the uh, liberal opposition slide. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it would be. Um, yeah, so as I suggested, I don't see this as, as an expansion of government, but a more rational way of doing things that we're already doing, like deciding who a child's uh, parents will, will be. Um, nothing that I've proposed is completely foreign to our current practices, right? You can find examples of, of all of these things. So we are already removing uh, a lot of children at birth uh, into uh, foster care and some into pre-adoptive placements. Um, and <clears throat> the research shows that on average children uh, placed for adoption and in infancy do better than the average person, right? Because you have presumptively more qualified parents than the norm, right? I'm not talking about the maltreatment population, I'm just talking about people in general. Uh, adoptive parents tend to be sort of super parents, not all of course, but on average. Um, so we were doing this already, removing children, quick termination, and it's just in a small, much smaller number of cases than I think ought to happen. Um, we are already making predictions. I mean, there's this myth of non-prediction that you hear voiced by a lot of CPS directors at the local and, and state level. I don't want to make predictions about people. This is the daily routine of CPS, making predictions about people when you decide, are we going to remove? Uh, or are parents likely to do this again? Are we going to return to parental custody? That's based on a prediction. Uh, we are getting better at making predictions. Uh, social scientists are developing algorithms um, based on review of enormous databases of past maltreatment cases. What factors, what parental factors, circumstantial factors correlate with subsequent maltreatment. Um, and giving CPS agencies uh, uh, instruments to use uh, in deciding, for example, what to do after a maltreatment report comes in. Should we remove or not? And they find that these algorithms are far more um, accurate, reliable, than experienced caseworkers' subjective judgments about parents. Um, so I'm suggesting, in part, doing that before maltreatment occurs. Uh, we already have uh, something called prospective neglect or anticipatory termination of parental rights, right? This is one of the other features of the Adoption and Safe Families Act that I th think was a, a great sea change, a great uh, movement forward, um, requiring states to authorize termination of parental rights <clears throat> as to one child based on maltreatment of another child previously. So if you had rights terminated as to one child before, that, along with a best interest finding, can be a basis for terminating as to a younger sibling. Right, so uh, in theory, in um, any state today, you could take a child at birth and immediately terminate uh, based on maltreatment history, kind of thing that birth match, which I talked about, would uncover. <clears throat> uh, and this seems to me far more rational than just having this blanket rule that everyone who's a biological parent gets to take a child home. Right, because we know that a significant percentage of those people <clears throat> have a maltreatment history, have a substance abuse problem, and are very likely to damage the child. And it's not uh, so difficult to identify those people who have that kind of history or current uh, dysfunction.
Uh, John Soliday, economist. Is there any way to promote the spiritual capital? It's not, not social capital, but you do, you do mention uh, wider uh, use of contraceptives. What about less use of sex outside of marriage? Uh, yeah, that's an uphill struggle to be sure. <clears throat> And there's some, uh, you know, wonderful ethnographic work on uh, pregnancy decision making uh, by people in poor communities where, you know, there's little hope for anything else gratifying in life. Uh, young people, girls and boys, will decide that a baby might uplift them. Um, and that's totally understandable that they would do that. They're not thinking about the reality of, of raising a child but just my life is a dead end street and um, I can transcend it at least for a while by having a baby. <clears throat> I totally get that in trying to convince them that there are other opportunities in life when maybe there aren't. I think it's extremely difficult. Not that I'm you know, at all opposed to saying uh, don't do it, try to wait, find you know, some other life path. Hi, I'm um, Marie Cohen. I have the blog, I write the blog, Child Welfare Monitor. I know I've spoken to both of you. And I'm just interested um, in hearing a little bit more about why you chose to focus, and even in the title, to talk about um, black lives specifically. Because I feel like what you're really talking about is a real alternative paradigm for child welfare policy. And so I would think it would apply to everyone, and especially because you're talking so much of substance abuse and now, of course, the big, the big thing in substance abuse is the opioid epidemic, which tends to be disproportionately um, occurring in white communities. So I'm just wondering why you chose to, you know, ha I understand a lot of what you're saying about how this whole anti-racist ideology has fed into this, but to make it like the t in the title of the book, so it's kind of like, okay, you know, I'm only talking about black lives. I mean, did you, you know, what was the reasoning behind that? Yeah. Right, well, I uh, started this book project um, both before the opioid crisis and before meth became a huge thing, which is also predominantly uh, a white phenomenon. Um, but really, I, th I think why I stuck with that focus is that I knew if I just proposed something broadly about reforming child protection policy, the first reaction I would get from people in my field is, no, there's gonna be a disproportionate impact, a disparate impact on people of minority race, um, and so this is just another instance of white people in power uh, dominating, taking away, inflicting more pain, condemning, uh, and so forth. So I address that head on uh, by making that the focus of the book. That's, uh, what I'm proposing is actually uh, a way to, you know, to prevent harm to that population in particular. I am Morgan from Brookings. Um, I think I might already know your answer to this, but I do want to just um, hear a little bit about your opinion on kinship care over um, non-relative care. Right, so this is a, a big issue. I mentioned that it's uh, one way caseworkers can avoid having to uh, you know, deal with the 1522 rule. Um, there is also a kind of ideology of uh, keeping children within uh, a group that is thought to own them, right? So this in part also, I think, is part of the explanation for strong uh, push in, f in favor of kin care. Uh, there's certainly some benefit to children of being placed uh, with kin, so all else being equal, if you're with rel biological relatives, it's more normal, uh, people who presumptively already love you, uh, there are definite benefits. Uh, on the other hand, we know that dysfunction tends to pervade families, it's not, typically isolated to a single member. Uh, and so you have to have <clears throat> concerns about uh, who, the, who the kin are. Um, are they it's typically grandparents, right? So the grandparents who uh, raised this uh, child who's now a parent and maltreating a child. Um, the research suggests um, that children placed in kin care, uh, uh, girls at least tend to do better emotion, uh, emotionally 
Um, there are benefits there. Um, boys, maybe not so much. Um, uh, but physically, uh, might do better in, in non-kin care. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a clear picture about, about which is better. I think it depends on the family, right? And, uh, I think what is necessary is just the caseworkers focus on the expected quality of caregiving rather than being driven by an ideology of, uh, you know, the family owns the child. Um, I'm Julianne Nava from Learning First Alliance. Um, our organization is actually putting together information about the long-term effects of abuse and childhood trauma on students in schools. And we're finding that their life expectancy can be as much as 10 to 20 years less than the normal American who has not experienced some physical Social emotional abuse, and I was wondering um, if you found similar um, statistics or results in your own work, and if that number surprises you. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, I'm familiar with research showing uh, correlations with or manifestations in uh, mental health problems <clears throat> uh, and criminal involvement, and those things you might expect to shorten life expectancy in the life course, uh, getting into dysfunctional relationships, uh, involvement to personal violence, um, unhealthy habits, addiction, right? All of these things would tend to shorten life, so makes sense. Please join me in thanking Professor Dwyer. <laughs>